I am barely sneaking this one in the weekend deadline because of having two dogs needing rescuing, and I'm not in a position to rescue dogs. Still, when an abandoned puppy comes up to you at a gas station in the middle of nowhere, you just can't leave her. And then my mother tells me that we've got to go pick up another dog that's supposed to be half boxer that somebody was abusing by just neglecting them. And we got that dog, and nobody told us that the other half was Great Dane. But now I'm the proud owner of a Rhodesian Ridgeback mix and a Great Dane, and this is going to be fun. But you didn't come here to hear about my sudden animal charity. You came to hear about how the wildly varying technologies in Mustara have to be dealt with. I'm Mr. Welch, and today we're going to go all the way from the Stone Age to the Texas Revolution and all parts in between. Welcome to Mustara. Mastara, of course, is known for its habit of cramming real-world nations, along with their fantasy equivalents, into the setting from the mostly Renaissance-known world to the classical-era Hollow World and all the way to the colonial-era Savage Coast. That means in one single setting, you've got Greek hoplites, Roman legions, Viking raiders, Texas rangers, and Portuguese explorers all in the same setting. That's not including Alphatian steampunk skyships, Glantry's Magitech appliances, the Black Lore elves with their super-futuristic pseudo-Blackmore magic and cybernetics, and, of course, the Great War-styled magic that is the entire basis of the Flying City of Serain. From a setting standpoint, it's a mess. The Hollow World, of course, to keep out the superior technologies, because all of their nations are largely set way in the past, has a cheat with the spell of preservation. Their cultures reject any culture other than their own, so even if Cimarron decides to invade using their magical boomsticks and artillery to turn the Nithian army into target practice, the Nithians will not upgrade their weapons or armor. Fortunately, the Hollow World is isolated enough that the superior technologies of the known world and the Savage Coast don't even know they're there. And even if they did know they're there, getting to the Hollow World is a logistic impossibility. There's a few high-tech areas in the Hollow World, but they're either restricted geographically, like the Merry Pirates or the Ostduke Gnomes, or have a built-in failsafe like the Black Lore Elves and their technology. The pirates might have modern ships, but they can't go inland. The gnomes are happy on their floating continent and aren't militaristic to begin with. And the black lore elves can't leave their valley and keep their magical technology working. When you look at the known world, things are a lot more even in terms of technology. Everyone, with the exception of the Etrugan clans, are at least at medieval levels, with several more developed like Derrickon. Only Rockholm, with its fairly advanced dwarven technology, is far ahead of all the other nations, but those dwarves aren't sharing the secret of trains and drilling machines anytime soon. For the rest of the known world, they are so even in terms of technology that no one has a massive advantage over another. A Vesland Axe gives no advantage over a Yalari Scimitar or a Thaetian Spatha in terms of quality. Magitech is the biggest game changer in the setting, and that's where the historical equivalents get skewed. For example, no one can match Serene in terms of air power. Alphatia might have airships and Thyatis has griffin riders, but Serene has biplanes. Fighters with magical machine guns and bombs that outrange everybody by literally a mile. The only thing in the air that threatens Serene is dragons. And for the rule of cool, I usually equip the city of Serene with those automatic steam artillery cannons from the Book of Wondrous Magic that fire basically rivets to make it all but impossible to attack Serene from the air. Air superiority has its benefits. Now, for the other nations, with their magical superiority, nautically, the Irindi fire ships take first place as far as a nautical power. Those ships alone are why Irindi, by all accounts a peaceful and tranquil island paradise, makes pirate captains wear their brown pants when they see an Irindi flag. It's not just the magical paddle wheelers, of course. Irindi shipbuilding is superior in all aspects because that's the one martial aspect the nation is very good at and they've done since their beginning. Better hulls and better crews mean faster ships that can run down and outmaneuver anything else on the sea. If someone really wants to invade Irindi, they have to deal with the five fire ships that are so advanced in technology they should count as magic relics. They're immune to harm, they dish out infernos like candy, and the iron hulls splinter anyone that tries to ram them. Nobody but nobody messes with the Irindi navy. As far as infantry, there's no real difference in any of the settings. Unlike the fantasy elements of Serene's Air Force and Irindi's Navy, no one has a fantasy tank battalion roaming around. Even the Wondrous invention styled tanks are either too unreliable, expensive, or difficult to manufacture or to be fielded in any numbers at all. Seeing one on the battlefield is a rare curiosity. Two of them is unheard of. Most of the technological differences are by choice. Few nations field units in heavy armor. Karamikos has its knights, but Derek encounters with light infantry with pikes. You aren't kidding large units out with plate mail or even banded mail, and magical armor is normally reserved for officers. The dwarves do have better armor, but they're a defensive army entirely, and few are stupid enough to attack dwarves on their own turf. When you get to the Savage Coast, you find the game changer for the technology level. The Savage Baronies have gunpowder. They are at the wheel lock stage of firearms, but there are still bullets flying around and even magical pistols and rifles. These turn armor into afterthoughts. 
The house rule I've always used for D&D firearms is that the only AC bonus is you get is magic bonuses and dexterity. So if you've got plate mail plus one and a dexterity of 10, you get a plus one against a bullet and that's it. It's not very widespread for a lot of reasons. First, it's difficult to make because it requires magical elements from the Cinnabril that coats the area. Second, it's harmful to the inheritors, the group that manages the Cinnabril trade, so they're trying to do everything they can to limit its spread. With the threat of boycott from the inheritors and their Cinnabril trade, most nations restrict firearms. This doesn't fly with the trigger-happy county of Cimarron, which produces masses of amounts of smoke powder, and the gun has replaced the bow and the crossbow as the go-to weapon. The inheritors can complain all they want, but as long as Cimarron doesn't care about the boycott, the inheritors can't stop them because the firing of a gun in close proximity is lethal to them normally because how it interacts with inheritor magics and their multiple gifts from the Red Curse. As Cimarron is very obviously based on the Republic of Texas, if you want guns, you go to Cimarron. Of course, outside of Cimarron, getting smoke powder is almost impossible or just too expensive in large numbers, but at least there's a place with gun stores openly doing business in Mastara. Gunpowder, like in real life, is the big change. Derekin and Minerthad, if they could get their hands on enough gunpowder to trade, the rest of the world would advance the Mastaran technological base centuries in a matter of months. It would become the most sought-after technology, and certain nations like Alfheim would do everything in their power to keep the gunpowder and its fiery effects out of everyone's hand. The amount of gunpowder needed to actually create the trade would be on the capacity of all but the largest baronies. Even Cimarron wouldn't be able to do it. And of course, the major problem is that while it's quite difficult, the curse that creates the smoke powder can be lifted. If firearms start a massive war between various nations, this could create a giant quest to remove the red curse and remove the supply of smoke powder from the world. At least until Glantry invents an equivalent for a price. Mastara, as shown, has wildly varying technological bases, but the game has built-in outs for most of it, while others are so far advanced no one is catching up anytime soon. Atrugan is in the Stone Age, practically, but they can't be assaulted because of their location on the plateau. Glantry is advanced magically with their technology, but it's so isolated it can't spread its technology easily. Conquering Irindi or Serene as suicide because of their advantages, but they're not expansionist. Trying to get the advanced technology of the dwarves or the savage baronies would be an adventure in and of itself, but getting close enough to change the scope of the setting would be quite difficult. That's the difference in Mastaran tech and how the setting handles it. It's surprisingly well diversified, with each area of Mastara having good reasons on why they aren't being conquered or why they aren't conquering their neighbors. Okay, there's a new poll up with Bards of Mastara barely making the cut. The new topic for review is the continent of Divinia to the south. So until then, remember, outside of a dog, a book is man's best friend. Inside of a dog, it's too dark to read.